Well, that last session left everybody really excited and really energetic and with thousands of questions. So Karthik, you're gonna have big shoes to fill. Karthik's our uh, moderator for this next session. We're talking about hindfoot trauma and arthritis. Um, our sponsor for the session is Miris, and uh, it's all yours, Karthik. Oh, thank you very much, Celine. Firstly, uh, many, many thanks to, to, to Celine for having invited us uh, to be part of this academic uh, bandwagon. It's an extravagance of the likes of which I haven't seen before. And I'm very grateful that uh, you've given us a chance. Uh, I bring you the warmest of greetings from the British Isles. Uh, we've got representation from all over. Uh, but firstly, I'd like to raise a toast. Uh, as we are Brits, we like our beer. Uh, and uh, this is to the very best for the Parrick uh, Family Foundation. Uh, I'd like to introduce my, uh, my glitterati. Uh, uh, we've got uh, Senthil Kumar, a well-known uh, orthopedic foot and ankle surgeon from, from Scotland, the Glasgow Royal Infirmary. Uh, we've got Hiro Tanaka, who is, uh, who is a well-known name uh, here in the United Kingdom. Uh, he's, uh, he, he holds many positions, not least the treasurer uh, of the British Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Society, a very important post. He holds the purse strings. And then we've got the Sheffield Shamans, because they wield some remarkable scientific uh, uh, magic. We've got uh, Mr. Chris Blundell, the, the uh, former president of the British Orthopedic uh, uh, Foot and Ankle Society. And of course, Mark Davis, uh, who is um, the secretary of the British Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Society. Now, we all know that, you know, towards the fag end of a conference, we are uh, sort of slowly walking our way to the bar. And it is here when we have a chat with a, a variety of our friends, peers, mentors, that we learn an awful lot. So we're going to bring this down to a pretty chilled out uh, conversation, really, between us. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to talk about hindfoot uh, arthritis, uh, diabetic hindfoot pathology, and some uh, hindfoot trauma thrown in, uh, all of which make for an interesting uh, uh, kaleidoscope of, uh, of cases. These are going to be case-based as we have stuck to the mandate, unlike some of our colleagues whom I've heard uh, through the day before. That's, that's great, guys, and that's what we do best. We stick to the mandate. So I'm going to ask uh, Senthil Kumar first to kick off with his case, please. Could you kindly share your screen, please, Senthil? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, hope we can um, see the um, uh, first slide. Um, uh, thank you very much uh, for that introduction, uh, Karthik. Uh, it was very kind. Um, as you said, we've all um, got patients that we... Um, found difficult to manage, quite daunting to start with, but equally um, uh, enjoyed um, managing them, treating them with a good result uh, most of the time, but unfortunately uh, not all the time. Um, but also we learned quite a deal um, from these patients, and I would like to present one such um, uh, case. Um, but this, this is one where sometimes you know you, you don't know where to start, and uh, so this I will present and then uh, we will have a discussion um, a bit later on. Um, the patient that um, is a 59 year old and uh, she came to see me uh, three years ago, um, having had uh, multiple surgeries uh, in the north of Scotland. Um, she had rheumatoid arthritis and um, um, she has had uh, knee replacements and revision knee uh, replacement and so on. So she was treated by uh, a surgeon who did a lot of orthoplasty surgery. Um, but some of those surgeons also uh, did a lot of uh, other joints um, and elbows, shoulders and, and foot and ankle as well. So he had, again, uh, done a series of procedures. He started with the hallux valgus correction. Um, they went on to do uh, triple fusion. It's not something that you would recognize as a triple fusion, but there's a triple fusion surgery. Subsequently, um, there's a calcaneal osteotomy because it didn't really correct the deformity. Um, and eventually, um, he also did an ankle replacement um, because how difficult could that be? Because he can do uh, revision, knee replacements, and ankle is you know, uh, just an extension of the same concept, uh, perhaps, in his view. 
Um, so she has got all this surgery, uh, but unfortunately, none of them actually gave her any significant uh, relief of symptoms, um, and she had uh, problems. Um, essentially, her, her problems were um, uh, forefoot and also on, on the lateral side of the ankle. Um, the hallux valgus had returned, uh, and uh, there was an ulcer between the second toe uh, and the hallux because of the deformity. Um, and the lateral ankle pain was the main thing in the hind foot because the heel was in valgus, and because that original deformity was never really corrected, um, and then the impingement was quite bad. And the replaced ankle didn't really have uh, that much movement, reduced movement, but equally painful uh, movements as well. Uh, and I will show you some uh, x-rays of that. This is the forefoot. I don't have, unfortunately, all the x-rays for you to see. Um, essentially, it looks like he had done a Keller's-type um, arthroplasty, excising the proximal half of the proximal phalanx, and that was the correction that he performed, which left her with the hallux quite short and um, um, defunctioned, essentially. And you could see the uh, triple orthodesis. Again, you wouldn't recognize that. I think there was uh, no preparation, no attempt to um, denude the um, articular surfaces of the cartilage and, and the staple across um, the teronavicular joint, as you can see. Uh, and this was an X-ray after the calcaneal osteotomy was performed, and the screws there and the subtalar joint clearly um, hadn't uh, fused. There is the ankle replacement. Um, it wasn't really. I think there's a lot of valgus. Uh, painful and it's failing loose uh, tibial component as you can see and so that's where she came to see me uh, so all of the areas are painful uh, symptomatic and uh, she would like something done so those are the x-rays and um, perhaps i could come to you uh, karthi for the discussion and then uh, we can then take yeah, it from there certainly but i think it's well worthwhile opening it to the panel uh, i think we need to concentrate on what the algorithms ought to be what you should correct what you shouldn't correct so can i sort of uh, pass this on to Mr. Mr. Davis. Uh, would you like to ask Senthil something for us? Senthil, the ankle replacement, is the ankle replacement painful? It is painful, yeah. yeah. It, um, it is not aligned as you can see on the x-rays and it's still in valgus and it was painful. Okay, and uh, has there been any suggestion of uh, infection at all after the ankle replacement? Fortunately, no, no. There, there was some delay in healing the original wound, so he had a kind of, you can see the kind of very unsightly scar, a badly healed scar, but it, nevertheless it's healed, and I did have bloods and so on, but they were all normal, uh, no, no evidence of any infection. Okay, so I mean, effectively what we're dealing with is a painful ankle uh, replacement. We, we have uh, issues with uh, potential non-union uh, and unprepared joints through the, the uh, Chopin area, and we have deformity associated with that and also with the forefoot. So um, there's an awful lot going on in this foot, um, and I would obviously be thinking in principle to, to deal with things from proximal to distal in terms of trying to rectify any issues. Um, is there any information in terms of a CT available with regards to um, union of the uh, triple complex and whether or not there are any cysts around the ankle replacement? No, no. That, uh, I didn't do a CT scan, um, but I can, we can tell you that the triple, we, we can actually see on the X-ray the triple joints had infused uh, and they are still uh, very open. Um, um, but there was some osteolysis um, under the uh, uh, Taylor component, but I don't have a CT scan to show you. Um, uh, but in terms of that, it, it looks as if the calcaneal cuboid certainly hasn't fused, but um, it's difficult from the projections I've got about uh, making a decision about the TNJ and the subtalar joint. Um, I think I'm, uh, if, if I can, if I can move you uh, on, um, Mark, we, you've got you've drawn the information out of Sendel, like uh, okay. blood out of a stone. Can we move to Chris? Chris wants to say something. O only because um, it's interesting uh, that Mark, you said you know start proximal to distal, and that is you know what we do when you've got deformity at the hip and then the knee and the ankle. But I'm not sure I necessarily agree here in in that it would be interesting to know before the ankle replacement was put in was the triple complex realigned effectively. So it's almost impossible now to determine where the level of deformity is. And I wonder whether the triple complex might have been moderately well aligned, at least at the subtalar and heel axis, 
um, and the ankles drifted into valgus because the ankles put in that way. So I, I would want to go back and try to get some old films before the ankles put in. I, I, I think, I mean, get, given that the triple joints are still open, um, I don't think there was any attempt at correcting it. I think it's one of those techniques where I have seen people just simply you know, put some metal work around the um, uh, in arthrodes joints, expecting them to fuse. Um, but 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 there's no there's no attempt at correcting this deformity. So the joints are still open, uh, and the deformity remains uncorrected. So Hero, can I move to you now and ask you what you think your algorithm would be if you were presented with this patient and you've got the information that you've got now? There's no infection. There's residual hindfoot valgus. There's a horribly shortened first ray with pain in all of these areas. Yeah, I, th I think the first, you know, th this is the typical kind of patient who has significant symptoms, but radiographically, you cannot make an algorithmic decision based on radiographs. I mean, the pain could be coming from anywhere, you know, whether midfoot, could be coming from the ankle replacement, could be coming from malalignment, um, it could be coming from the forefoot. I mean, look at the second metatarsal, it's hypertrophied like crazy. And, and this, is, this is where I think we need to move away from the technical elements, and then just sort of, you know, otherwise we're gonna be focusing on the ankle replacement because that's the most exciting thing. And actually with patients like this, I really sort of sit down with them and I actually try and formulate a list of what their what their symptoms are and what they where they believe it's coming from, and then put pros and cons of each of those elements so that you can get a kind of a more holistic approach. You know, because otherwise, if we focus and narrow, narrow down on certain joints and certain problems, I think at the end of the day, even if we address, let's say, the ankle replacement, I'm not sure whether the patient's going to have, have a happy result at the end of the day. So I think this is one of these situations where we do need to take a step back. Um, all I was going to suggest was basically in terms of investigations, I often find that in this situation, a, a spec uh, CT is quite useful because that gives a real map of um, which areas are hot. And, it, and it's kind of a broad investigation that allows you to target down in certain areas. Okay, well, it's quite clear that um, none of you are wishing to nail uh, your colors to the mast. So can I go back to Mark and say in, in 20 seconds, what would be your order of, 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 of resolution of this particular problem, Mark? Um, Come on, spit it out. I'd, 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 uh, <laughs> I'd redo the ankle replacement and uh, certainly redo the triple at the same time, probably. Okay. Uh, uh, Chris, very quickly. Uh, re redo the triple, leave the ankle, uh, let that settle, and then revise the ankle. Hero? Um, Absolutely not to, you know, I, I would not immediately go to um, revising the ankle, you know, this needs to step back, proper investigations, proper discussion with the patient, as I said, I would get a spec and then be reasonable about the decisions that, that um, I make, you know, yeah, but okay. I wouldn't immediately go to surgery, surgery is not the thing that's on my mind. Okay, well, Sandal, perhaps you can now tell us, you've got a couple of minutes left, so you could tell us uh, what so you did. This, this is what go. I did. I think, I mean, what, what she wanted was um, her forefoot done because, you know, you know, patients, I think they've got other priorities. Her son was getting married and she said, look, could, could you do something to the front of the foot so she can wear shoe on the day? Um, so that was her priority. Obviously, that's, we have to respect that. Uh, but my uh, plan was to do the hind foot first and then go to the forefoot. Um, but, you know, because of that, you know, I went ahead and I did the forefoot first. Um, um, some of the metal work is, is obviously in, uh, causing a uh, problem. But there's a, is a distraction orthodesis because you needed the length to the first metatarsal. So I put an intercalated bone graft from iliac crest and plated that and used that extra screw uh, to get the fusion done. And uh, so that, that kind of restored the weight bearing function of the forefoot. Uh, to an extent, but there was some concern about whether we are going to be, you know, uh, running, uh, going out of position when we correct the hind foot. But this is always the difficulty when we do the forefoot initially um, before the hind foot. Uh, so I did that um, uh, first, and then a year later, um, so there's a lateral view of the um, first MTPG arthrodesis. Um, then the next year, I went and did the uh, triple arthrodesis. Uh, again, I was able to correct it only modestly because of the, the, the ankle replacement was still in the valgus position. So that when you look at the x-ray, looks as though it's still in a lot of valgus. Uh, but I was able to correct, and you can see there's some space between the lateral malleolus and the calcaneus uh, at this stage, and the fusion was certainly beginning to um, happen. Um, and then a year later, um, I did the um, ankle uh, joint. 
Um, the option was to fuse it, uh, replace it, but I went for um, the, uh, the X-ray of the triple fusion. Uh, definitely calcuneal cuboid fused, telenavicular fused. Um, then I did an ankle replacement, the revision ankle replacement uh, in uh, the original ankle uh, was removed and the alignment was certainly achieved. Um, with this particular uh, uh, prosthesis star, they have a very big revision uh, polyethylene that I could use. And there was good bone, um, the whole calcaneus on the talus had, you know, gave me a good chunk of bone to uh, play with so that I could put the, put the talus in. But in spite of that, the tibia had to be resected further. Um, so did that cure her pain? It did, it did. And so that actually what you see is a one year post op X ray. Um, so that the pain was in fact um, relieved, and she was happy with the whole foot, including Excellent. the forefoot foot alignment and everything. And she was she was uh, pleased with it. Yeah, Brilliant. yeah, that's a good outcome in the end. Thank yeah. you. It's an interesting concept, starting from the forefoot and moving to the hind foot. Something that I, I would almost never do, but it clearly has worked for you. So yeah. I, I I agree that the preferred option would be the. Uh, the the hind foot first, realign it, and then work around the hind foot to get your final alignment right. Okay, thank you very much, Senthil. That was an interesting case. We're going to now move on to uh, Hiro Tanaka, who is going to talk about one of his horror cases: the uh, 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 patient with um, with hind foot uh, Charcot arthropathy. Hiro, all yours. Yeah. Okay. Can you see the screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. So this is a story of a. A patient with diabetic hind foot Charcot arthropathy, and this patient's kept me up many nights in the, the previous years. So I picked this a case for two reasons. The first reason is basically a technical one about when enough is enough, essentially. Um, and what I tend to find is that I'm always on the side of uh, reconstruction, um, but actually what price is the patient paying for my kind of enthusiasm to try and reconstruct this patient's hind foot. And the second reason why I picked this case is that there is a very human element to this, because I find that a lot of the patients that I treat for over 10 years or more, and they come back and forth to the clinic, um, they develop a relationship with both myself and the clinic staff that's kind of akin to a, an extended family almost, especially when they live alone and they don't have any sort of close family members. So this is why I picked this uh, particular case. So let me tell you about him. So he is a 63-year-old gentleman when, I, when this particular event happened. He's an established diabetic neuropath. He's been coming back and forth to the clinic for over a decade or so with multiple um, small problems, which were uh, managed. Um, he's got a BMI of 56, which um, is not abnormal for South Wales, actually. This is, uh, this is um, relatively... Watch out, unique. hero. Watch out. <laughs> um, from a medical standpoint, um, I mean, he wasn't particularly great. He's had a previous ischemic heart disease, he's got lymphedema. And importantly, he lived alone on his own uh, with a dog, which he loved very much, the relevance of which will come later. So he um, attended uh, the GP practice just for a lymphedema check. And the GP sent him for an x-ray uh, one day. Um, and this is the x-ray. He wasn't particularly symptomatic uh, in the ankle. It was just maybe slightly so more swollen than usual. Um, so, you know, not, nothing terribly abnormal. The joint space is a little bit wide on the ankle there, but there's a very quinous x-ray. So he came to um, the clinic three weeks later just for a routine check, and he wasn't, again, wasn't symptomatic. Um, and his ankle was hot and swollen, but he had no pain. There were no ulcers. Uh, vascularity was normal. CRP was slightly elevated, and HbA1c is 92, which for him wasn't too bad at all, actually. Um, but... The x-ray, definitely there's something weird going on here at the subtalar joint. That is lateral view there. So certainly with those kind of appearances, there's something going on, uh, some deformity going on at the subtalar joint there. So um, essentially I treated him uh, as an acute charco. Um, and certainly in our unit, um, we generally tend to um, prefer using a, a bowler walker, which is some Beagle orthopedics. And the bowler walker looks a bit like this because it keeps the patient more mobile. And if you think about a patient who's BMI 56, live, lives uh, alone on his own, a TDC will basically render him immobile. He would have ended up in hospital. So this really sort of maintains mobility. And I think there's good evidence um, that uh, a bowler walker from a clinical standpoint is just as effective as offloading as a TCC. Now, normally, I don't MR acute Charcot arthropathy, but in this case, I was a little bit worried because CRP was elevated, and I just wanted to understand a little bit about what's going on in the subtalar joint. So this is his MR. 
And this, you know, and the thing that really stuck out was this kind of massive fluid collection. And now I'm thinking, God, this is, is this sort of infection that I'm dealing with here. Um, and so that was really the primary question that I had. So I actually took him to theatre and I explored immediately. Um, and just this kind of synovial fluid came out, which I sent off to uh, microbiology. And as it happened, there was no growth in microbiology um, at all. And I never treated him with antibiotics. Um, the subtalar joint dislocation, um, I was able to reduce, but it required a tip post and FDL tenotomy to do so. And he went back into a bowler walker. So the question that I would put to you guys is in the case of a um, acute hind foot, whether it's ankle or subtalar, um, Charcot arthropathy, is there any merit in um, any form of stabilization? Because these patients tend to be very unstable. And bearing in mind, at the time, I didn't know whether he was infected or not. So, so no. Harry, can we have a little discussion about that? About acute uh, absolutely. stabilization well, of the, well, uh, yeah. Chris, would be, Chris, do you want do you want to take that on and uh, and uh, mm. and fire your thoughts into the arena, please? Yeah. So uh, the first thing that uh, uh, crossed my mind was that your first ever series of X-rays showed a widened ankle joint space, which immediately rang a worry to me because it's difficult to get a widened joint space under any circumstances. Did you ever get any weight bearing films? We we really nail our diabetic team into weight-bearing films because I think that would have alerted you much more early to what was going on. You know, you, you didn't diagnose the subtalar dislocation until you had an MR. But I no, think it was only was three weeks, Mark. It was only three weeks. Yeah, I'm Chris, by the way. But even so... Oh, um, sorry, Chris. That's OK. <laughs> we're, we're, we're almost indistinguishable, I know that. But um, uh, but three weeks, three weeks is three weeks. And uh, I think... Uh, standing x-rays would have been helpful. I'm, I'm not being critical here. I, I'm just saying it's a sort of an edu as an educational point, I think standing films just tell us so much information. I, I completely agree with that, actually. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, just, it's just in the history. I didn't even know. I, I, I didn't see the patient. It was no, a GP x-ray. It was a G, yeah. yeah. So, so but, but you're right. If, if, there, if it was um, in any way a little bit dodgy, then a weight-bearing x-ray, I think, could be useful. Um, I mean, you know, CT is just, you can, we can get CTs on the day. You know these days so um you know in in that instance i'd also um get a ct it's, it's, as well it's the difficulty is the algorithm of trying to um tell your diabetic team when you want a ct when you want an mr when you want plain films yeah and if you true. tell them that you always want weight bearing films then the alarm bells would have rung earlier as you say harry you know three weeks is three weeks but you know you, you may have had a better opportunity a bit earlier that's what i'm saying mark okay. you want to say something Mark? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I was thinking, actually, if you've got this great MR image, uh, you can see there's fluid there. And in answer to your question here, I wonder whether you could have got a, a radiological uh, aspirate of that fluid to give you at least a gram stain in a provisional culture. And then in, in terms of answering your question to get acute stability of uh, a Charcot dislocation, I think that is the right thing to do. Certainly, if you see an acute uh, dislocation of uh, the midfoot uh, through a Charcot process, and that is what you would do. It's almost your your ideal opportunity while things are mobile to get a reduction. Central, yeah, uh, no, that that's that's not a, um, a stable uh, hind foot. I mean, you can see it is a, such a severe dislocation. I know you 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 got it corrected by the um, tenotomies, but was it stable when you let it go? I, I, I have a feeling that would have been quite unstable. Well, Synthol, uh, I'll tell you now, because it wasn't, because uh, two weeks later, uh, he'd completely fallen off. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, you know, he'd fallen off here, and literally within, I would, I, I would say days, you know, um, if not uh, maybe two or three weeks or so, um, partly due to the pressure necrosis from the uh, lateral process of the talus. And also, I suspect... Despite the negative microbiology initially, and I did send several samples, I, I, I think in hindsight, I think there was infection there. Um, well, why would you think that, Hero? Why would you think that? Well, because, because there wasn't, because, because there because, wasn't I mean, it can't be endogenous infection, but you could get this synovial uh, collection with just yeah. a charcoal and a dislocation, couldn't you? Yeah, I think I think you can do. Yeah, it's just it's just that the way that this it blew out on the wounds over such a short period of time, um, and you know this is the appearance is literally weeks after I'd taken 
back to theatre, you know, uh, maybe less than three weeks. Um, you can see talus is exposed and that uh, wound grew Staph aureus and uh, mixed, mixed flora. Okay. So this is, this is what I'm thinking. Um, so with that degree of instability, Hero, you know, if you put a, a, a hind foot nail up, which might have been what some people would do, uh, you'd have seeded that infection right up the tibia. So there, are, so there's a, a real school of thought that says, put that foot in jail by putting a, a frame on it. Yeah. Um, our experience in Sheffield is not great in that regard, I have to say, but I think there would be a very strong argument for doing that really early on. Yeah, so that was that. Um, there was a discussion, and actually, the discussion about a frame actually comes at this point here. So at this point, it's really uh, pretty desperate, isn't it? Um, and um, so, what did you do? Well, okay, right. Uh, so um, he didn't want an amputation. I, I, I know what you're saying, Harry. Speed up. Um, so he said, uh, please, please don't take my leg off. We did have a discussion about um, frame correction um, and uh, debridement and. Um, I've heard this once before, but his primary concern about a frame, which I didn't do, was his dog, actually, because he, yeah. he can't keep the dog away, away from him. And actually, he was, he was actually concerned that the frame would actually hurt the dog. Anyway, so, so but he was systemically well in himself. CRP is creeping up. It's clearly um, infected now. Um, and that was a problem. So, you know, these are the options, really. Um, and... Um, and this is where I guess my relationship with him kind of played a part because ordinarily I think frame would have been probably the ideal option here, but I went along with protection of his dog. So he didn't want that amputation. So I went in there with an acute debridement, um, put just a pen just to try and stabilize. I definitely didn't want to put a nail up there because it was staph aureus everywhere. Um, and the pin stayed in um, for about uh, three months or so until basically it fell out. So the, the good thing is, is that this basically allowed his wound to completely heal. Um, without did you actually did you actually debride it then and, and stuff it with uh, yeah, uh, with, uh, with antibiotic yeah. stimuli? Yeah, okay. right. yeah, yeah. So loads of stimuli went in. Um, you can see he's in a bowler walker, so he stayed in a bowler walker basically to manage the wound until the wound had healed. Um, so the year later, uh, of course, we, the deformity is the problem. The wound is still healed, but the deformity is there. So we got a forty-five degree deformity. Now we're talking about how do we get how do I get this patient into a shoe? Um, and the real challenge at this point really was the white cell scan. There's infection everywhere. Hind foot, talus, um, navicular. And this was, the, this, this, is the, this was the real challenge, what to do now. An unsurable foot with, what, with evidence of deep infection. So I'll just, I'll just get on with it, and I'll just tell you what happened, essentially. Um, uh, so, again, he... he um, he didn't want the same conditions. He didn't want the frame. He didn't want amputation. Uh, so took a risk, you know, in discussion with him. So um, essentially cleared out as much of the infected talus as I could. Stuck a hind foot nail up. A um, couple of months later, his wound is healed and his foot is reasonably well aligned, except it is a little toe. I don't know what happened there. Um, and uh, a few months later, he's walking. Um, Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so, but at the end of the day, um, the X-ray is shocking. <laughs> so, the, oh, this is what the X-ray looks like. It's a shocking X-ray. But, um, but he's walking two and a half years later. There's no recurrence of infection. But I think, I think in hindsight, I, I would have made different choices. I think, and I would have had different conversations with this chap. And I think partly um, my relationship with him did affect uh, the kind of decisions I made, you know? Um, but sometimes you get away with it, you know? And I think so far, I've gotten away with it. So uh, going back to perhaps Chris, Chris, would you, would you go back and fuse this again? Uh, it's clearly a complete and total non-union and that nail is going to fail at some stage. He's a big fella. No, he's, he's going to end up living with uh, intermittent infection, this man. Um, I, I would say you, you may be infection free now, uh, but you and I, and we all know that this will bite him back at some stage. And we've a lot of patients in Sheffield uh, that we've all looked after for a long time where the relationship, as you rightly said, Hero, is absolutely paramount. And this patient will always thank you for what you've done so far. 
and you'll need to babysit him through the, the next for the rest of his life, which probably yeah. you, you'll do for the rest of your working life. And a time will come when he will, you know, he, he will get reinfected probably, and you'll ameliorate that with antibiotics and and so on and so forth. I, I wouldn't go back into this uh, until his nail breaks and you have to. And I don't think that will happen. It'll it'll pass out one day, and you'll have to just suck that up and move on. That, I think it's about the relationship, exactly like you said. Uh, you know, you become part of this guy's extended care group, and uh, I think that's where you'll end up. I wouldn't do anything with him. You're doing great. Uh, Sentel and, uh, uh, and uh, I, Mark, I, I, would you agree? I, I agree. I think I mean, at some point you have to go back and again and do it, but I perhaps maybe do a, a plate um, a fixation rather than another nail or a frame. I think, I mean, they, they, they seem to provide much better stability. I think the key is stability. I think you, you can control the infection. Even if there is infection, go ahead and do a good fixation and um, stabilize it as much as you can. Uh, I don't think that nail is actually uh, stabilized it that well. So um, I think I think I'd leave him well alone. He's got a pseudarthrosis and he's not passing out at the moment. Live for the moment. Hey guys, we have a question here. What antibiotic did you add to the stimulant? Was it Vanco, Tobra, or both? Yeah, Vanc and Gent. That, that's that's the usual standard combination. Yeah. And what what? Uh, how much did you add to both? One one gram of uh, Vanc and two hundred and forty milligrams of Gent. So that goes in a in a in a twenty gram um, twenty gram stimulant, yeah. Pack. Twenty mils. Yeah, twenty mils. Yeah. yeah. Don't be pedantic, Mister Blundell. That's what I got to put up with, Harry. I know. I can imagine. <laughs> okay. Well, now we we head off to the uh, we head off to the 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 Sheffield Shamans for their for their um, foot and ankle trauma horror show. So, uh, Chris, can you share your screen with us, please? Thank you, Hero. That was excellent. That was a lovely, uh, lovely case, and uh, plenty to learn from it. Okay. So, can you can you see my screen, guys? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Mark and I are going to uh, sort of double act through uh, a number of cases, and we'll just keep going until Harry tells us to shut up. Uh, we work in a major trauma centre with a lot of support of uh, plastics and all of the bits that you'd expect from a, a major trauma centre. So our, our first case, uh, I'll talk through this one, uh, if that's okay, Mark. Um, so this is a 74-year-old lady uh, driving a car, head-on collision, disappears down into the footwell of her car and uh, presents with a, a, an isolated injury to her right hind foot, which is um, open. Uh, plain films through the emergency department are, as you can see, uh, with a, an open wound uh, over the tip of the fibula here. Um, she gets into CT, uh, which is uh, our, a sort of very common uh, thing that happens through the MTC. And the CTs, you can see the sagittal and transverse uh, images there. So a pretty complex situation. Uh, I'll, in the reasons of time, Harry, we, we won't perhaps discuss everything that we can all see, but I'll talk no, through fine. them. So we've got a Taylor's fracture, which is comminuted. We can see a, a fracture line that's running both in a, a sagittal plane uh, and also a fracture line that's running in the coronal plane, uh, medium miles off, and a transverse comminuted fracture through the fibula. And if you look there, the sustentaculum is off as well. So we're, we're sitting here looking at an open, complex hind foot injury, and you can see gas in the soft tissues there, can't you? Which I think is really important. Uh, these views show the subtalar joint is not uh, correct, and the cuboid is blown uh, as well. Um, so I suppose we kind of perhaps know what we're going to do, but maybe, uh, Harry, you could ask folk what, what order of play people would do. Yeah, OK. Here, you can, you can kick off the proceedings. You know, this is one of those heart sink cases. So uh, you've got the information. So you can, you know, try and get your gear wheels going and tell us what you think you might consider. How you, how, which ones are you going to fix first? What are you going to do with the wound, et cetera? You want me to go back? Hero to previous images. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. There's so much going on there. But but so so in the in, in the acute setting, it's an open fracture. So in the acute setting, obviously it's 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 span, scan, and plan. But you know you you've got an acute CT here. But certainly with this type of injury, I'd certainly be looking to span it initially, um, which basically uh, would allow me to collect my thoughts and plan this uh, a little bit carefully, and also allow some of the soft tissues to settle down. So I'd put the uh, um, delta frame on the ankle. So in terms of the definitive fixation, I guess, I mean, the joints, you know, the, the ankle joint is just, is going to be a 
it's going to be, become degenerate anyway. But fundamentally, we do need alignment and we need stability. So I think looking at that, you've got a convenient uh, medium alveolar osteotomy, essentially, to approach the uh, Taylor body fracture. Um, the thing that worries me is the picture in the middle there. It, it appears to be like a central fragment of the talus, which is kind of fragmented there. So I don't know. Um, maybe that's the posterior element there. But I'd certainly approach the... Um, the uh, talus through the medium alveolar osteotomy, then uh, stabilize the um, the sustentaculum. Uh, and I'll be tempted, it, as long as there isn't a, a joint depression element to that, I'll be tempted to, because you're on the medial side, just to put a, a screw from the medial side in the sustentaculum. Um, fibula, uh, yeah, I think, uh, again, stabilize everything, really. Um, okay. uh, stabilize the fibula with a little small locking plate. Um, and then the cuboid, um, that, that does appear subluxed, so we'd have to go for that as well. And I'll probably do the cuboid at the end. Um, so I look, probably need a so, bit of a spanning plate. Yeah, so I think it's interesting looking at the lateral sagittal CT there. If you look at that CCJ, it's shut down, isn't it? Because the cuboid is, is bivalved, and uh, mm. so the lateral column is shortened. Harry, do you mind if I just press on? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Okay, so... Um, Essentially, the, the patient was taken to theatre, not by a foot and ankle surgeon, because it, they were on call. And uh, perhaps a degree of, of lack of experience um, meant that, that the injury was washed out, uh, an X-fix was applied, and they took the opportunity through the medial side to fix the talus. And I guess this is sort of pattern recognition stuff where, you know, talus fracture equals longitudinal screw down talus doesn't really appreciate the original complexities of the talus fracture. Uh, so the X-fix was put on, the talus was inverted commas fixed, um, and then the other injuries after the weekend. So this is what we pick up after the weekend, is this situation. Um, and I don't think there was an appreciation really of, of the magnitude of the subtalar joint dislocation, because these films, if we just go back there, the subtalar joint is still not reduced. Mm -hmm. uh, the talus is still hitched off the back of the posterior facet. So uh, the patient was essentially have the talus revised um, here and, and refixed, and you'll see the absence of the longitudinal screw because, uh, quite rightly, the surgeon who did this, which was actually Mark, um, appreciated that the talus fracture didn't need a longitudinal screw. What it needed was anatomical reconstruction in the uh, sagittal plane, which or sagittal plane fracture, which was done, and then exactly like you said, hero, long medial plate, um, posterior fragment uh, restored, and the fibula put back out to length. Um, and then the CCJ was bridged out, and it was the CCJ bridging out which allowed the subtalar joint to reduce, and that was really the foot-ankle kind of bit in this that I think wouldn't be appreciated perhaps by a general trauma surgeon is that that subtalar joint is going to remain dislocated while ever the CCJ is dislocated because that's what's swinging the talus in rotation. Um, so I think that's probably the lesson in this case is is think carefully about the order of what you're going to do and consider carefully what the CT scans show. Um, did you use a tourniquet? Uh, I did, Harry, yeah. Okay. Uh, presumably, you had to let it down a couple of times, did you? I mean, it must have taken a couple of hours at least. Uh, it didn't take very long because there was a big hole on the lateral side. Of course. Um, yeah. I had to remove all the bits and pieces um, that had been put in, which took a bit of time. Um, and, and actually, if you, exactly as Hero said, use that medial malleolus as an osteotomy, you get straight in on the talus. So actually, uh, I, the first thing I did was to reduce the CCJ, and that then just everything was a bit, it fell into place. Well, that's, um, that's exactly the, that's the story. That's the, uh, the lesson to take home, isn't it? That's the yeah, lesson. You know, you, you, you forget to realize that the stability is afforded by the, 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 the lateral column, and if it is grossly shortened, no matter what you do, it's always going to remain subluxed. And I think yeah. people other than foot and ankle surgeons would, would be focusing on the ankle and, and missing the fact that the subtalar joint is screwed unless you get it right. You, you obviously haven't worked with Mark in theatre, Harry. It's like the flashing blade. You've got to watch your fingers there. Um, <laughs> it, it, it doesn't take long. Okay, so, um, you know, what about avian and the tailors? Are, are we expecting that, guys? Oh, yeah. Hmm. Okay, well, no, I think not. not probably, necessarily. Because, yeah, I think it's, no, yeah. because remember, the fracture plane is a sagittal fracture plane. Exactly. So the vascularity from the yeah, medial side and the true. lateral side is good. So, no, so I, I think not really, um, and it didn't happen. As you can see, these images are down the track, and uh, we haven't got AVN. And I, I think in that fracture plane, we, we're not so concerned. So, uh, Did you take okay, the bridging well, plate out? We would do, ordinarily. Uh, I, I haven't so far, uh, Harry. She's happy. 
Good. Excellent. Let's okay. crack on. Let's crack on. So, Mark, over to you for case two. Okay, so this fellow was up to no good. Uh, I don't know why, but he was on the top of uh, a first-story roof uh, whilst drunk. Um, he fell off the roof and in we've the flower bed. We've all been there, Mark. We, we've all been there. I know, I know, honest. easily done. 12 hours later, though, um, he was found in the flower bed and um, he was transferred to uh, uh, me on call. Um, otherwise, he's a fit and well uh, chap um, and this was an isolated injury. And you can see here that it's uh, a clearly very deformed uh, foot with a burst injury to the lateral hind foot skin. Thankfully, not particularly contaminated, but of course, there's been this delay before getting to us so that we could do something with him. So, uh, again, Harry, open it to the other chaps. What, what information do you want about this chap if, you're, if you've got that man in your ED? There you are, Sentinel. Your well, turn to go, mate. Start, start with an X-ray. That would be useful. Um, see what's happened. Um, and, and probably a CT scan. I think that would be the uh, two initial uh, investigations I would like. Yeah, I think that's fair, Sentinel. Um, and we'll move on to the next slide. The, the, the radiographs were... Not hugely informative, but clearly the CT um, is. Um, you can see that there's uh, gas in the ankle joint and it, it's subluxated both at the ankle and the subtalar joint um, with that sort of hitch fragment. Uh, and then there's this uh, neck stroke body fracture of the talus. So um, at the same time, it's got a, a subluxated subtalar joint and uh, it's, it's much more comminuted on the medial side of the talus. Um, so, just to summarise, we've got an open burst wound of the lateral hind foot, gas in the ankle, subluxated ankle and subtalar joint, a neck stroke body fracture with subluxation, and it, there's comminution on the medial, medial body of the talus. So, so was, there, um, was, there a, was there a chunk of talus that actually came through the lateral wound then? No, Mark? no, it was all there. <laughs> Everything was there. The whole jigsaw was there. Um, but it needed to be put back together. So I guess is, you know, how, how do we handle this, chaps? But, uh, what can you actually feel through the open wood? Was it the talus? Was it the lateral malleolus? Do you know? Well, I, I think it was mainly lateral malleolus that you could uh, feel central. Um, it, that, that burst wound was was not particularly informative, to, to be truthful. Yeah. Harry, Harry, you're you're on call at the moment. You're probably going to get one of these tonight. Why don't you take take a moment and tell us what you might do? Okay. Well, I mean, what is what is obvious is it's a highly comminuted talar fracture. Uh, there's a, there's an open wound, so clearly uh, wound toileting, etc. And then go back to the 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 span scan and plan phenomenon. If uh, there are other injuries to cope with, uh, you said it was an isolated injury, so I think it's well worthwhile trying to piece the jigsaw together. Not. A, it, far easier to say but clearly there is significant subluxation of both the ankle and the and the subtalar joint which needs to be reduced uh i would probably go through the the lateral open wound extended uh, i may have to uh, use additional incisions possibly a, a, a medial incision if i can't gain access but i think i think a lateral wound will be my my first search point to try and piece together the fragments uh I'm still trying to work out what's happening with the syndesmosis, for example. Uh, was the syndesmosis intact? Um, I don't think that's a problem, Harry. I think we're okay. looking at everything is below it's that. Yeah. Everything is talus and, and, uh, and, the, and the oscalsis presumably is intact too. That's actually fine on this fellow, okay. actually. Um, again, so, you know, the, the question is, you know, have we got all of the fragments ready and available to put back together again? Headless screws. Uh, I might possibly consider building a frame around it uh, or use a femoral distractor to try and, and open the okay. area up uh, okay. to, to try and gain good access and try and put the fragments back in. Okay, I mean, I, I think that's very reasonable. Um, I, I, was, I was worried about the lateral um, wound. So the next slide uh, asks the question, which approach to do? And I think you're quite right. It's, it's, it's one of those slight conundrums as to, to what is the best way of accessing this talus. Um, so actually what I did do is the following slide, which was a medial malleolar osteotomy. I did wound toilet, so everything as you suggested on the lateral side. Um, but I was, I felt that uh, there was that jammed in fragment on yeah. the medial malleolus. And I was thinking, where on earth does that come from? Um, I'm gonna need to see it, but I knew that the body was involved. So I did this medial malleolar osteotomy um, and next slide shows 
literally a, a, a selection of uh, headless screws, but also polyglycolic acid pins just to literally fix things in, in situ. Um, and uh, yeah, so Chris is doing my slides and that's brilliant. He's showing exactly what I want to see. And then um, because- it looked, it, like it, been, it looked like there was a little plate there on that, on the earlier, uh, the, the one before this. No, that? that's, just, that's just fluid. Uh, yeah, oh, there's no, there's no sorry. plate there, Harry. No, sorry, um, sorry. We, we don't own any plates in Sheffield. <laughs> um, <laughs> Harry, yeah, I meant, I meant that. Yes, yeah. Yeah, that's just water. That's yeah, sweat, okay. sweat. That's sweat. The from Mark sweat. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, a, a bit like uh, I've got into the habit now when these you have these nasty taluses where you've got poor soft tissue envelope. I do put them in a, a, an external fixator as, as yeah. their plaster of Paris afterwards. It just allows you great vision of their soft tissues. Um, and so you can see that I've done that here and the fixation, um, as you can see on the right-hand side. So it kept it to a minimum. Um, just, just curious, right. looking, at, looking at that x-ray, is there an extension uh, uh, deformity at the at the fixation mark. I'm not being critical. I'm just observational. Uh, is that yeah that one there? It looks like the there's mm -hmm. a kind of flexion at the telonavicular joint level. And uh, is there a dorsal subluxation? Do you think, or well, is it just me? No, I don't think it's just you, Harry. I think that it's a possibility, um, okay. but I think it wasn't gross. Thankfully. Okay. I, I, I was going to, I was going to suggest um, an anterior approach, our anterior extensile approach, I would call it. Um, that, in my experience, gives you a very good view of the tail of neck and the body, uh, and in combination with your lateral incision, I think that would have been given a much better exposure. You've just got to be experience. got to be so careful, Senthil, with what you do with the blood supply, because it's so tempting when you do that to work your way laterally and medially, uh, and the next thing you know, you've devitalized. But the, but the predominant blood supply is uh, through the through the lateral sinus star side. I think if this is already, you know, if you had a big open wound, then it's probably gone, and then you're relying on the medial blood supply. I think there's very little blood supply actually enters through the neck in the in, in the front. In fact, I think so. Um, I think my, my I, I've I've done a few of these cases through the anterior approach. I think we are very used to that as ankle replacement surgeons and so on, and it's much better uh, view of the whole of the talus. And we in fact wrote it up as a paper uh, some time ago. So uh, that, because that, that would have reduced your talus and the body because if, if I am correct, the next slide shows that there's a bit of a deformity developing there. Cynthia, do, well, do you reckon you could get that, uh, that sagittal split back through an anterior approach though? You've got to try and fix that medial side to the lateral side it's gonna be really hard to do from the well front. i think that's why i think if you have a lateral approach as well a lateral incision where well, you could see that uh, you should be able to fix that um yeah, you, but, you can, but the problem central was the the chunk that was lying below the meat jammed in below the medial side yeah. and i think that i personally think that that would have been really difficult to actually fish out through an anterior incision unless you dissected all the way medially wouldn't you well, well I the think anterior end concern. of the fragment, you could actually see it coming uh, into the neck. So you should be able to see it from the from the front. See one of those sections, you can actually see it. Uh, okay, um, all right. So, oh, fair enough. So, Mark, what, I'd like to commend you on your osteotomy. It's actually a beautiful example. You need to use that for your teaching slides. You know, it's properly the exit point is properly lateral because that's the problem with the. Uh, the, doing a medial malleolar osteotomy, isn't it? It's just yes, correct. Much, it comes out the medial gusset, essentially. You can't see what the hell you're doing with a tail up. Yeah. That's proper lateral, um, and, and that's really sort of nicely a vertical um, osteotomy, which is great. The only thing which I would ask you is, um, I often find that when, when I make the osteotomy, the, the line of the osteotomy is more vertical, and therefore the fixation, I find, is more reliable if I actually put my screws in horizontally across, uh, so in other words, parallel to the joint line. So an anti-glide at the apex of the um, osteotomy and then two subarticular uh, yeah. screws. You know, that, that, I, I, but you I probably pre-drilled it, didn't you? No, I agree with you. And, and, and that's what I would ordinarily do. To be honest, I didn't need to get too far lateral in this instance. And if I do, then I would do exactly as you suggest, because uh, it's more of a platform plasty rather than a medial malleolar osteotomy. I think that's absolutely right. I, I think we should call, stop calling it medial malleolar. We should be calling it medial plafond osteotomy. Yes, yeah. Yeah. correct. Yeah, yeah. Uh, good. Yeah. 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 Right. So, yeah have, you, have, you got, have you got two more cases, uh, Mark? Uh, yeah, we've got two more cases. We've, we've, got, we've got nine minutes to go, so might as well why, wait. We, why don't we skip through to the next one, then? Well, okay. it's not. One or, or, 
Well, because this is important to finish off, and then we'll skip okay. to the last one quickly. Go so, on, let's okay. finish this story. So th this this chap, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> then ended up with a problem with um, his medial wound, and um, these are X-rays, literally uh, eight, ten weeks down the line. Um, and uh, any thoughts from you, chaps? Hero. Um, well, he's clearly having a problem, isn't he? Because he's not weight bearing. I mean, there's disuse osteopenia. This, you know, the thing that. Well, I mean, you know, it looks like infection because it's periosteal reaction on the medial side. Um, yeah. And there's loosening of the screws. So this is infection until proven otherwise. I think you're right, Hero. So we'll move on two slides. And, and basically, the next step that I did was to uh, aspirate uh, through an open wound um, uh, some fluid. And actually, it came back as negative, And he hadn't been on antibiotics. So um, I was slightly disappointed in a way not to have something to hang my hat on. Um, but things sort of did grumble on and then settle. And the next set of images um wow, i yeah. think uh, show that it's it's literally just progressing whatever's going on it must be infection um you can see i've removed one of the screws when i did my biopsy um and um you know arthrosis and and probably deformity because of the slight uh, uh malreduction of the taylor head component so um we then CT'd him and you get this horrendous moth-eaten look that you can see here. It's, it's really starting to look uh, very unhappy. Um, and I think actually I handed them over to Chris at this stage and the next set of images shows exactly what we did. Um, and thankfully he settled down, but it was a long, a long old haul, this one. Well, that was also a pretty brave decision. If you did think that there was potentially infection there and you, you were driving a nail up, uh, that was a brave decision, but clearly it's worked really well for you guys. It was pretty, uh, pretty radically debrided, uh, Harry, and uh, the okay. nail was bathed in stimulan at the same time. So, uh, you know, anyway, there we go. Excellent. Okay. Okay. So, um, oh, yep. Yeah, sorry. Let me go to case three then. So, standard Sheffield unit, uh, twenty-four-year-old uh, guy with uh, without really giving us a history. Uh, we don't really know what happened to this guy, if I'm honest with you, but there was some story of the police and a, and a dirt bike. Um, <laughs> and uh, this this guy presents with these x-rays and an open injury. Um, and you can see a kind of theme uh, to, to what we deal with here. Um, so span, scan and plan is the mantra. The, the honest truth is, though, with the MTC is that these patients get a... Um, get a CT as they go through the unit. So quite often it's actually scan, span, scan, plan. And then right. Mark and I quite often do scans down the track. So they end up with scan, span, scan, plan, scan, um, which is a lot of scans, but it gives <laughs> us the information we need. So uh, debrided, and this is a real good case of shared care. So debrided and spanned at the outset, let those soft tissues go. Um, so the first definitive scan of his hind foot is with an X fix on. Um, so I think we can see, uh, I'll just bite it really. So, uh, tailor navicular doesn't look right, does it? Uh, cuboid blown as is often the way, uh, anterior plafond doesn't look great either. Um, so we've got again, a sort of a hind foot and ankle, uh, problem going on here. Um, so we staged this, uh, and decided to start with his, uh, show part complex because he's got this lateral wound, um, so that wound needs to be clean before we can extend to uh, to really fixing his cuboid, which we, again, like the first case, we think is really important to realign the hind foot. So he starts with his ankle. Um, so you can see again here uh, a sort of minimally invasive stabilisation of his uh, lateral malleolus with just one six five screw and then a nice big plate on the medial side to get that ankle right. Um, and if you look at his show parts joint now, it's it's reduced but not stable. Um, so uh, we then go on to, to bridge here because his navicular is blown and so we tend to bridge these uh, through the uh, first cuneiform into the talus with a bridging plate and fix his cuboid with a, a sort of snazzy little cuboid plate. Um, we know that those plates, when you bridge these navicular fractures, they either break or we need to remove them. Mm. Um, Mark and I just wanted to just perhaps throw out for those who are still on here and interested that we've classified and published um, cuboid fractures in the JPJS in 2016. And there's a sort of comprehensive classification of these injuries, which overlaps 
with this paper, which was the navicular classification paper. So you can see at the bottom there that type fives are both the cuboid and the navicular, which is what this guy had. Um, so there's the soft tissues, and we, we, we let those, that was his original blowout that you can see on the sole of his foot. Uh, so hence the sort of dirt bike uh, sort of deceleration into the ground uh, created that wound. Um, and we end up with a situation like this. So we've got the ankle fractures fixed, the uh, show parts joints bridged and stable. But if you look here, uh, if I can make my mouse show, you can see that plate's failing. Yeah. Here, the screws are breaking. So important to counsel your patients about that. I don't know whether you guys would take that hardware out. What, what would you do or would you not well, do it? I, I think the tailor and avicular plates are very poorly tolerated, so you have to take them out. I, I, in my experience, earlier the better. I, think, I don't think it's lost any more than two months, three months, and then it starts to fail. So then it becomes painful as well for the patient. So, I have to be honest and say, I don't take them out. Uh, I just let them break because yeah. it's a further ins insult to the soft tissue. So I don't bother with that. I just let them break. Um, it, it, it we've, got, we've, got, we've got two minutes, guys, okay? So I think, as Hero is about to say, it does depend on the patient. So yeah. some patients are very anxious and you need to take them out. Some mm. patients are relatively low demand and you can leave them. But the screws in the plate can cause problems to the wound if you leave them too, uh, as well as mm. if you take them out. It's a tricky situation, but um, mm. I thought I'd just throw that up there before our last case, which I, it sounds to me like we haven't really got time for. I don't, I'm afraid. I'm afraid we're we're likely to run out of. Uh, okay. But you can well, you can I'm run through it if you want. Yeah. No, all I'm going to show you because uh, is perhaps uh, these set of images here because this was the other side. This was the perhaps arguably less injured side in this patient. Perhaps Mark can in one minute just talk about the decision making here. Yeah. Um, insane man who stayed insane for months after falling and closed injury. Um, the frame guys really didn't want to do anything with this chap because you wouldn't tolerate a frame. Internal fixation was impossible. Um, so we came to the conclusion about rebuilding his P1 with uh, a custom uh, prosthesis, which you can see here um, with a, a model to, to work out your resection margins, uh, reaming up to allow for the stem of the implant, packing the implant, uh, and then uh, fixing the implant. Um, which is the next slide, and then the post-operative images at four years. Um, and this chap's reasonably happy, you know, given uh, his mental state. Uh, he's got two legs. His other leg is, is not great, great either, but, um, it, yeah, that's my triple fusion to rescue his open hind foot. Um, it, you know, disastrous injuries, these, but um, those... Uh, custom-made prosthesis might be a way out of some of our problems that we've talked about. Tonight. Did you use the fibula as the bone graft, uh, Mark? Uh, I did, yes. Um, I did, That's what yeah. yeah. I so put it through a spinal We do bone. a lot of those custom implants at our institution between myself and one of my partners, and and uh, they allow for a tremendous amount of limb salvage. So, hey, Karthik, that was a great session. Some amazing cases you guys uh, showed in some wins that uh, you guys got. But um, thanks to all of you um, for, for hanging out with us. And uh, Karthik, thanks again, as always. Brilliant. Um, we'll be back in a few minutes. Thank you very much, guys. Well done. Well done, indeed. Brilliant stuff. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bye. Seth, Mark, Hero, and Chris.